And that concludes the basic building blocks of graphs. So we saw forks, chains, and immoralities. Those are the main building blocks to build more general graphs. So given those building blocks and how association flows in them, we can now move on to the flow of association and causation in more general graphs. First, we'll give a more formal definition of what a blocked path is that we've been talking about. A path between two nodes X and Y is said to be blocked by a uh, potentially empty conditioning set, Z, if either of the following is true. If along the path there is a chain or a fork with W in the middle of that chain or fork, and W is in the conditioning set Z, then that blocks that path. Right, so this is what we saw in the chains and forks part of the lecture. And the other way that you can block a path is if there is a collider, W, on that path that is not conditioned on. So W is not in the conditioning set Z. And none of its descendants are conditioned on, right? Because we saw that if you condition on its descendants, it's a bit like conditioning on the collider in the sense that it induces association between the parents. Okay, so that's what a blocked path is. And you can see how it uses the building blocks of what we saw in chains, forks, and immoralities. And then an unblocked path is just a path that is not blocked. So if you don't have either one or two here, then you have a path that is unblocked. And we needed this definition of blocked paths and unblocked paths to define a very important concept, which is known as deseparation. With the notion of a blocked path defined, it's really easy to define deseparation, and it's that two sets of nodes, X and Y, are deseparated by a set of nodes, Z, if all of the paths between any node in X and any node in Y are blocked by Z. And deseparation is such an important property because it implies independence. So, Given that P satisfies the local Markov assumption with respect to some graph G, then deseparation in the graph implies independence in distribution. So here, this independent sign with P here means independent in distribution, and then this independent sign with a G here means deseparation in the graph. Okay, so deseparation allows us to read off conditional independencies in the distribution. And this is such an important theorem that we'll call it the global Markov assumption. It turns out that just as the local Markov assumption was equivalent to the Bayesian network factorization, the global Markov assumption is equivalent to the local Markov assumption. As I mentioned before, for the Bayesian network factorization equivalence proof, here too you can see the Kohler and Friedman book for proof of this. And because these two are equivalent, we'll often just refer to them as the Markov assumption, rather than specifically the local Markov or global Markov. And this very nicely matches the terminology that we use, where we say P is Markov with respect to G, it's just like saying P satisfies the Markov assumption with respect to G. Okay, so because deseparation and the associated blocked and unblocked paths concepts are such important concepts in this course, we'll now do a good amount of practice with them. So I'll be asking many questions, and at the end of each question, go ahead and pause the video if you want to try to answer the question. In this slide, we'll always be talking about whether T and Y are deseparated given different conditioning sets, and we'll always denote the conditioning sets with shading in the variables. So the first question is, are T and Y deseparated by the empty set? The answer is no. For example, there is an unblocked path from T 
to y going through m1 and m2. What about if we were to condition on m1? Then are t and y deseparated? The answer is still no, because there is an unblocked path going from t to w1 to w2 to w3 to y. Okay, what if we were to condition on w2? Then are t and y deseparated? Yeah, it turns out they are this time. How about instead of conditioning on w2, we condition on w3? Yeah, conditioning on w3 is still enough to block the path through the w variables. What about if we were to also condition on w2 in addition to m1 and w3? It turns out that that doesn't change anything, and t and y are still deseparated given those variables. Okay, what if we were to condition on x2? It turns out that conditioning on x2 unblocks the path that used to be going through the collider x2, so the path from t to x1 to x2 to x3 to y. So when we condition on x2 here, because we unblock that path, t and y are actually not deseparated given this conditioning set. What about if we were to additionally condition on x1? Yeah, conditioning on x1 fixes the problem that we introduced when we were conditioning on the collider x2. So now if we condition on all of these gray variables here, we do have that t and y are deseparated by them. Okay, two more questions, and we'll use a new graph for these questions. In this graph on the left here, are t and y deseparated by w and x2? It turns out that even though w blocks the path from t to w to y, x2, because it's a descendant of the collider x1, unblocks the path down below. So t and y are not deseparated given w and x2 because of x2 here. What if we were to not condition on x2? Then t and y are deseparated because x1 is a collider, so it blocks the path from t to x1 to y. 